Okay, professors and my fellow students, please remember to stay muted and keep your camera turned off if you are not asking a question. For technical support, you can send us a message via the public chat for assistance. The seminar is about to begin. Honorable guests, esteemed professors and my fellow students, welcome to the joint seminar series held by the College of Business and School of Law. I am Emma Lee, a second year student majoring in Global Business Systems Management from the Department of Information Systems. It is my pleasure to be your master of ceremony for today's event. On behalf of CityU, I would like to welcome all of you to this seminar series. This event is organized by CityU College of Business and CityU School of Law. The joint seminar series aims to facilitate innovative idea exchange between professors and students from different faculties and areas of study. Students are encouraged to think outside the box through engaging with emerging technologies to create powerful and impactful global solutions. Today, we are extremely fortunate to hear more about the concept of contract ambiguity in interorganizational governance and its strategic role in governing interorganizational relationships from Dr. Zheng Xu from the Department of Marketing of College of Business. Allow me to introduce Dr. Zheng Xu, who is currently an associate professor from the Department of Marketing at City. Dr. Zheng received her PhD from the marketing PhD in marketing from the from the University of Wisconsin Madison. Her research lies in understanding how firms may employ various relationship governance mechanisms to govern interorganizational relationships properly, so as to reduce conflicts and enhance trust. In addition, her recent research studies how GIS informed location choices impact firms' financial performance and survival. Dr. Zheng has published in leading marketing and business journals, such as Journal of Marketing, Journal of Marketing Research, Journal of Operations Management, Journal of the Academy of Marketing Science, and the Journal of Retailing, etc. She has also published in law journals such as Alabama Law Review. She has been actively serving as reviewers for a number of marketing and business journals. I would like to invite Professor Wan Wai Yi, the Associate Dean of the School of Law, to present a souvenir on behalf of the School of Law to Dr. Zheng. Okay, please look in here, please. It is our pleasure to have Dr. Jung discussing her article titled Effects of Contract Ambiguity in Interorganizational Governance. Today, Dr. Zheng will discuss the usage of contract ambiguity within the interorganizational context as a strategy, providing new insights into the strategic design of contracts and their outcomes. Dr. Zheng's work critically discusses the findings and effects of it. Without further, without further ado, I would like to in welcome Dr. Zheng, please. All right. Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for the introduction. And uh, thank you for attending this seminar, both uh, either online or on the ground. Uh, it's my great honor to present my research uh, through this opportunity of College of Business and the School of Law joint seminar series. So my plan today is to present two research projects of mine with the major project um, shown on this first slide. Uh, the effects of contract ambiguity in interorganizational governance. So this paper was targeting our marketing audience uh, and had been published in Journal of Marketing last year, 2020. And if time allows, uh, I will also present another research project of mine that has been uh, targeting the law audience, had been published in the law journal, Alabama Law Review, um, 
uh, hopefully, so this opens discussion and avenues for future collaboration because both of the projects, I believe, represent my attempts to collaborate with our law colleague. Uh, both of them are co-authored with Uri Binalio, a law professor from Israel College of Law and Business. Okay, let me get started. So this project uh, got started when Uri and I met a couple of years ago back in a conference in Spain. Uh, the, the good old times when we can actually travel, right? So uh, we, we met uh, over a lunch banquet and we were sitting next to each other. So we started talking. So I was saying that um, although the prior literature predicts and recommends that a contract, business contract should be written specifically with specific terms. But what we see in reality is many business contracts, particularly the franchise contracts, because both of us were interested in studying the franchise contracts back then. Um, many of the business contracts, particularly the franchise contracts were characterized by frequent use of big words let me give you an anecdotal uh, evidence here. So this is a 7-Eleven store franchise agreement in year 2013. In one of its sections, it says, we agree to use our best efforts to make the stores available to you within a reasonable time. So we can see there are some vague words here, best efforts and a reasonable time. What do those, firms, uh, what do those terms mean? How can uh, firms verify their efforts in meeting those standards? Well, if you are familiar with the business contract, you will realize, you will know that uh, this is not a cherry picked example. Many business contracts, is, um, including franchise contracts, are characterized by the frequent of uh, vague words like this. To elaborate, uh, in the prior literature, uh, with the role of contractual uh, governance being realized in the prior literature, there has been a robust body of research that studies the role of contracts in governing the business transactions, particularly in facilitating both cooperation and coordination. And the literature uh, specifically states that the wording in the contracts should be clear and unambiguous so as to minimize the potential conflicts ex post potential conflicts from arising um, and to increase the relational performance. The International Association for Contract and the Commercial Management, which is the practitioner organization, also specifies contract ambiguity as a key pitfall in contract drafting, suggesting firms avoid such a pitfall in contract drafting. So here we also offer a definition for contract ambiguity, which refers to the case in which the provision of contract is reasonably susceptible to more than one meaning, one interpretation. So if the words, the terms are open for to interpretation, we define it as ambiguous words. All right, um, we have to say that uh, prior literature also noticed that this phenomenon uh, of uh, vague words, although they call it differently. For example, uh, in economics, they offered several alternative explanations for incomplete contracts. So one of the uh, explanation they offered is bounded rationality, which is a uh, so-called unintentional cause for incomplete contract. We are all humans, right? We are all limited humans. We cannot foresee what will happen in the future. For example, nobody would foresee that COVID-19 was coming before it actually did. So it, it is um, you know, practically impossible to exhaustively list out all the contingent states in the contract. Um, so because of this reason, the contract is inherently incomplete. And the second reason, the alternative reason they provide is a so-called intentional uh, cost um, hinged on um, transaction cost theory. Uh, I guess many of you are very familiar with this theory, uh, which has been widely applied in business studies 
So this theory, according to this theory, firms may intentionally move the ex ante contract drafting cost to ex post adaptation costs because it is very costly for them to collect evidence, to analyze the different situations and to provide a verifiable uh, confident evidence for each uh, state, right? For each contingent state. So it's very costly, expensive to do that. So they would rather uh, wait until the trans transaction actually occurs so as to move the ex ante contract drafting cost to ex post adaptation cost. So if anything arises, uh, they will just uh, adapt or renegotiate uh, with their business partners. Um, both of these explanations make sense, right? Um, but here we were thinking, uh, we were wondering if there is a third explanation for firms to use a vague words in business contracts. So we call it a strategic purpose. So we're saying that given the unique features of franchise relationships, franchise may strategically use the ambiguous contracts to govern the business transactions so as to minimize or avoid undesirable relational outcomes. Uh, speaking of the unique features of business format franchising, let me uh, give you a little bit background on that, uh, just the, uh, so that everybody, we are all on the same page. So these are the top 10 franchise brands uh, ranked in year 2020, last year. Uh, so uh, I guess many of you are familiar with this brand, Sonic, that's a, a US a drive-in restaurant uh, brand, 7-Eleven, Taco Bell, Dunkin' Donut, UPS uh, store, sport clips, we can see for many fast food or delivery services or other standard service industries, business format franchising uh, has been widely used. So how does a business format franchising actually work? So in the franchise relationship, there are two parties involved. One party is the franchisor, who is expected to maintain the brand value of the franchise system, as well as to maintain the, uh, to control the system quality, right? To make sure that everybody does their work. And also, unlike licensing, which is typically a one-time deal, okay. for franchising, the franchisor is expected to offer ongoing assistance and support to the franchisees throughout the contractual terms. Uh, so typically a franchise contract may range from, yeah, it, it really varies like a range from one year to maybe even five or eight years. But the current trend, one is ongoing trend is that uh, the franchise contracts ten, tend to be shorter. So we see uh, many franchise contracts only have one or two years or even three years um, uh, 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 contractual terms. So throughout these contractual terms, the franchisor is expected to provide uh, regular support, consistent uh, support to the franchisees in terms of how they should operate their business. On the other hand, the franchisees, they are expected to make payments to the franchisors, right? So including the lump sum uh, upfront franchise fees, as well as the ongoing royalties, which is typically a percentage of the gross sales of the individual franchise uh, outlets. On top of that, franchisees are also expected to contribute or to take full care of the daily cooperation in, uh, of their own franchise stores. So because of this, the franchise business format franchising is really an effective strategy for franchisors, for franchisors to expand their business quickly, leveraging on both the capital and human resources provided by the franchisees. However, this business format is not without its own limitations. The reality of franchise relationships is that they are oftentimes characterized by frequent and serious disputes due to divergent goals and interests, free riding, and perceived or actual opportunism. First of all, franchisor and franchisee may have different goals. Think about it. For the franchisors, what they care is the system level, financial performance, the revenues, right, and also uh, the brand value, uh, so as the brand value is not damaged by the individual franchisee's behavior. But for the individual franchisees, what do they care about? 
what they care about is only their own individual franchise outlets, their own profit maximization. They don't care about the rest of the franchisees or the franchisor's interest, right? So because of this inherently divergent goals between the franchisor and the franchisee, there is some tension going on. And free riding, because it's a network of franchisees, it's not just the one single franchisees. So some inevitably some franchisees exert more greater efforts in operating their outlets than other franchisees. Uh, however, the less uh, uh, hardworking franchisees can still leverage on the brand value and also the efforts of those uh, more hardworking franchisees, so-called free riding problem. And last, um, perceived or actual opportunism. Um, actually, I published another paper in Journal of Retailing in year 2017 with uh, two other marketing scholars on this uh, uh, so-called double-sided moral hazard problem. Uh, so moral hazard here is equivalent to uh, opportunism. So we are saying that because uh, traditionally the franchise relationship is considered as the prototypical agent relationship with the franchisor being the principal and franchisee being the agent. So the literature was saying that the franchisee's interest, sorry, uh, the franchisor's interest is dependent on the franchisee's proper behavior. So the franchisee has some uh, chances to engage in opportunistic behaviors. However, in that paper, according to our own data, we found that both of the parties could be the agent of the other, right? Not only franchisor's interest depends on the proper behaviors of franchisees, but vice versa. The franchisee's interest also depends on the proper behaviors of the franchisor. So both parties could engage in the opportunism that is either perceived by the other, by the other party or that actually happens. More importantly, uh, or you know, more related to the use of contract, another important feature of franchise relationship is that the franchisor offers unilaterally drafted contracts to franchisees. So how does the contract the drafting work? So basically franchisors do all the work. So they draft the contract and they offer it to the prospective franchisees on the take it or leave it basis. So either the franchisee accepts the contract and join the system, or they reject the contract, but which means that they cannot join the system, right? So with this said, uh, we believe that there is sufficient reason to uh, argue that to to uh, hypothesize that you know franchisors may strategically use this unilaterally drafted contracts to protect their own interest, to protect their own prerogatives. Uh, and to, for example, such as minimizing the undesirable relational outcome. Okay, and Uri told me, my law co-author told me that actually in the law literature, there has been a research stream that has been studied the use of ambiguous contracts in governing the business relationship. Uh, for example, Choi and the Triantis in 2010 contend that contract ambiguity may actually serve as a screen on promisees' decision to sue. So promisees here meaning, uh, uh, you know, the party to whom the promise was made in our uh, context, referring to the franchisees. Sorry. So uh, by this point of time, I guess we can draw a preliminary conclusion that firms may use the uh, contract ambiguity, that is by use of vague words, out of strategic reasons, which is different from the alternative theoretical explanation provided in prior business studies. So with this recon recognition, we developed the two uh, inquiries. First, uh, we are wondering what are the relational and financial, financial consequences uh, the firm's use of contract ambiguity leads to. If that's the case, what are the consequences? And the second, uh, what are the underlying mechanism that you know, supports this uh, a relationship between firms' use of contract ambiguity and their relational consequence? So based on a thorough literature review of both business and law studies, we have developed the following three specific research questions for our paper. First, um, we were wondering how firms' use of contract ambiguity affects the relational outcomes specifically 
franchisee initiated litigation. So uh, because we think if you want to use the contract ambiguity to uh, to, to deter the franchisees from uh, uh, bring a lawsuit against you, the franchisee initiated litigation would be a direct, most straightforward consequence of that. So we want to see if this relationship holds true uh, both theoretically and empirically. And here, as I mentioned, the franchise contract is unilaterally designed by the franchisor and it's offered to the franchisee on a take it or leave it basis, uh, which uh, results in, which uh, gives us sufficient reason to argue that franchisors may strategically do this to protect its own prerogatives. And the second, we were wondering how the relationship between such use of contract ambiguity um, and the franchisee initiated litigation moderated by socialization activities. Well, the notion of uh, socialization uh, has, has its deep roots in both uh, business, actually also in the law literature. It's consistent with the notion brought out by Macaulay, a law professor uh, back in 1963, uh, non-contractual uh, relations, and also uh, in 1985, the uh, social contracts. Right, uh, and uh, in our marketing literature, in the inter-organizational literature in general, we also have a robust body of research that studies the role of non-contractual elements in governing the business uh, relationship together, jointly used with the contractual governance. So here, extending this research in our study, we developed two different types of socialization. One that happens between the franchisor and the franchisee, and the other happen, happens among the franchisees themselves. So we were wondering if these two different types of socialization um, play differential role in moderating the main effect, as I just mentioned. Okay, and lastly, we want to see empirically if the franchisee initiated litigation do lead to do affect the firm's financial performance. Because as we all know in business studies, the financial performance is the very lifeblood of the business and is always of great concern of both um, of scholars and practitioners. Okay, to illustrate this graphically, here's the theoretical framework for our study. All right, and uh, let me now uh, go through the research hypothesis to briefly explain the rationale for each hypothesis. So in hypo hypothesis one, we argue that increase the contract ambiguity of franchisor obligations because we, we said it's again, it's uh, relative to the franchisees lawsuits, right? So it's the contract ambiguity of franchisor obligations decreases uh, franchisee initiated litigation. Uh, which is based on two main rationales. First one, uh, we argue that the use of contract ambiguity has a cost prohibitive effect, which is very consistent with what law literature has argued. We actually conducted a pretty thorough uh, literature review uh, ambiguous, uh, on the research on the ambiguous contract in the law study. And we found that there is a, a uh, quite some uh, number of studies that talked about uh, the use of ambi uh, ambiguous contract. They were either uh, saying that the uh, use of big words or use terms, big terms are quite prevalent in uh, business contracts, or they were saying that uh, they were the ambiguous contracts could be used strategically out of strategic purpose. For example, in uh, Choi and uh, uh, Triantis 2008, they were saying that it, it's uh, used as a screen on the promises incentive to sue. And in the last study listed, listed out here, it is saying that it serves as a deterrence for the franchisees uh, to sue. So this is our first uh, uh, argued underlying mechanism uh, for the relationship between contract ambiguity and franchisee initiated litigation. And the second mechanism we argue is based on the interorganizational governance literature in business studies. Uh, there has been recent discussion on the conflict, the different conflict solving approaches in business studies. And um, so, uh, for example, Lumino and Mohotra 2011, which has brought out two different conflict solving approaches. Uh, one is so-called rights-based, uh, which is more argumentative. So um, this is uh, 
contingent on firms' use of specific rules in their business contracts. Uh, but the other conflict-solving approach is more cooperative in nature, which is called interest-based approach, uh, which is uh, more uh, related to firms' use of general standards in their business contracts. So we argue that uh, with the use of vague words, it actually fosters the use of letter approach uh, so that the disputes will be resolved in a less adversarial way. Uh, because by using a vague words, uh, it encourages both parties to talk, right? So if something arises, it's like uh, we'll just talk and because it's um, confusing. So we want to clarify our misunderstanding. So uh, it really encourages communication and uh, uh, and uh, the encourages the disputes to be resolved in uh, by the latter approach, an uh, interest-based solving approach. So these are the two main rationales for the main effect hypothesis. And the second hypothesis, we propose that this main relationship will be amplified or strengthened by firm, by the use of franchise by the level of uh, franchise or franchisee socialization. Why is that? Based on the main effect logic, uh, we are saying that with a greater level of socialization, it provides an alternative and less costly way for firms to solve disputes. And with the presence of less costly way, why do firms bother to go to litigation, right? It's, uh, so the cost prohibitive effect of contract ambiguity would be even more salient. And the second, uh, we developed, uh, so, so it will encourage, uh, strengthen the uh, cooperation fostering effect of contract ambiguity as well, because with the franchise or franchisee socialization, uh, there are some more greater opportunities for the franchisor and the franchisees to communicate and work on the problems jointly. So there is no need for them to bring the case to court. So it further strengthens the negative relationship uh, of the uh, contract negative effect of contract ambiguity. All right, in next the hypothesis, um, we uh, discuss the role of the other type of socialization, the one that happens among franchisees themselves. However, unlike the franchise or franchisee socialization, we argue that it uh, mitigates the negative effect of contract ambiguity on franchisee initiated litigation. Why is that? Because um, first, uh, with the franchisees bonding together, because this provides an uh, opportunity for the franchisees to bond with each other, right? They talk instead of talking with the franchisor. They talk, the franchisees talk among themselves. So this could help them first to collect some information with the help of peers, which uh, makes it less costly to, um, to, to sue against the franchisor because it's less costly to collect the evidence. And also by bonding together, they may strengthen this perception of injustice, which discourages firms use of uh, which um, mitigates the effect of contract ambiguity in discouraging the, um, sorry, in uh, encouraging the interest-based solving approach. All right. And lastly, we argue that the franchisee initiated litigation is negatively related to franchise system financial performance because on the uh, one hand, it increases cost significantly, right? The more lawsuits that were brought against you, it's more costly for you to fight uh, uh, with your with, with, with the one that bring the lawsuit. And the second, it also reduces the revenues by both uh, by reducing both the royalties and the franchise fees. With the individual franchise outlets performance deteriorating, the there's simply less royalties paid to the franchisor. And on the other hand, it really projects a litigious image of the franchisor, which reduces the appeal of this franchise system to prospective franchises, in turn reducing the of the franchise fees uh, revenues uh, that franchisors could obtain. All right, so so far I've finished all the uh, conceptual framework. Um, any questions or comments or how do we do this? Do we save all the questions to the end, right? Okay. Okay. All right. So uh, we can uh, open for discussion and the questions at the end. So now I will just continue to the research methods section. So to empirically test our hypothesis, we employed a multi-method, uh, three studies 
to um, test our hypothesis. First one, uh, the first study, the purpose is to demonstrate the discriminant validity of this new concept uh, in the marketing literature because we know that it's never an easy job to introduce a new concept, right? As I mentioned, in the prior business studies, there is no such concept called contract ambiguity. Uh, we have some related constructs, which I'm going to show you in the next slide, but we have to distinguish contract ambiguity from those priorly used uh, related con uh, constructs. Uh, so we have done two things. First, so we run a CFA, confirmatory factor analysis, and also we establish the anomalogical network in which we test the effects of uh, these related constructs on the same outcome, trying to distinguish their effects over across uh, 150 real franchise owners. Okay, so the related con constructs that we have identified in the prior literature include contract specificity and the contract completeness. Um, you probably still uh, remember that I mentioned the contract incompleteness at the beginning of the talk, right? Incomplete contract, which is a common term used in um, economics literature and in marketing in business studies, we continue to use that term, uh, which refers to whether the relative, uh, sorry, relevant clauses are codified in a contract or not. So basically, if we think about the contingent state, then we include it in a contract, then we deem this contract to be more complete. Uh, however, it doesn't really tell us whether they, uh, they use the big words or not, because they could, you know, uh, we, 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 they could say, oh, we will uh, rely on the good faith efforts, right, to, to respond to this uh, potential issue, this, this uh, potential contingent of a uh, state, but it's still pretty vague, right? So even though it's included in the contract, but it's still pretty vague. So it's different from contract ambiguity conceptually. And another one related one is contract with specificity. The way how it was defined in the literature was uh, quite similar to contract completeness. It refers to whether all the elements such as implementation procedures, technical specifications, resolution, et cetera, have been included in the contract or not without specifying, without mentioning uh, if the contractual clauses are, are ambiguous or not. So we first, uh, but here we define the contract ambiguity as where the contract terms or provisions are reasonable, reasonably susceptible to more than one interpretation, which is different from the other conceptually. And then we collected, uh, we administered a survey over 150 franchisees and uh, solicit their responses to these different measures, as well as some other outcome variables, which I'm going to show you in the next slide, uh, in the next couple of slides. And uh, then we run first to do two things. First, we run the confirmatory factor analysis to see whether the coefficients low to different items. Uh, and uh, and they, they, we, we do see that they load down different items as, supposed, as how uh, they are supposed to be measured. And the second, these are the outcome variables we collected survey data for. Intention to litigate cooperative performance litigation costs. We just ask the franchisees to think about their own experiences and uh, uh, rate those skills, uh, multi-item skills. And we do see that contract ambiguity has a unique uh, distinctive effect on the three outcomes compared with other related constructs, um, which uh, demonstrates, helps us, which helps establish the discriminant validity of this concept. So after this has been done, then we can move to, to the next study, study two, which is our major study. So in this study, we are trying to build the statistical relationship between, uh, at, build the statistical relationship as hypothesized empirically. So we collected and match merged the data from three different sources, uh, which I have to say is quite effort intensive and takes about, uh, you know, uh, about a year, um, between half a year and a year to do that. But um, so it, it really gives us some rich data on the, uh, the, the things, uh, the research questions of our interest. So we first, the major data source we use is the franchise disclosure document. I know that many of our colleagues, uh, uh, particularly our law colleagues are probably familiar with this because they're in the US, uh, so these are all US data. In the US, there is a, a disclosure um, requirement 
um, by the federal level um, that requires the franchisor to disclose the uh, relevant information to prospective franchisees before the relationship franchise relationship is formed. So through this franchise disclosure document. So this document contains a lot of information regarding the operation conditions of the franchise system uh, and their uh, projected growth and litigation history, etc. financial performance, etc. And in 14 states in the US, there is also a second layer of scrutiny on this uh, data source, uh, the so-called registration law states, right? So in those states, uh, the uh, state level also require the franchisors to file and regularly update their franchise disclosure documents at the state level. Uh, so it's with the double scrutiny, I believe that uh, uh, we, we believe that the data obtained from that source are quite uh, valid, reliable. And also, uh, so, so we obtained the data over a 10 year window, 2004 to 2013, over 106 franchise systems. And we supplement this data source using two other data sources, Entrepreneur Magazine and Franchise Bonds Questionnaire when the data were missing in FDDs. Okay, so here's a, a table that summarizes the variables, operationalization, data sources, and the supporting literature for all the focal uh, constructs in our paper. So for franchising initiated litigation, we measure it using the number of litigation initiated by franchisees in year T for franchise or I, uh, which we obtained from FDD because one of the sections in FDDs is the litigation history in which the franchisors are required to, to disclose the past 10 years of litigation history. And the second uh, franchise uh, performance uh, is nothing else but the difference between their revenues and the cost and the revenues consisting of uh, royalties and the franchise fees. And the contract ambiguity here, we uh, work with our law colleague together to generate a list of those words indicating vague standards. Uh, so we only included those that have uh, literature support uh, for indicating uh, the vague standards. So these words uh, such as the reasonable, um, best efforts, good faith, fair, uh, and uh, satisfaction, uh, adequate, equitable, sufficient, appropriate, significant, and also their variation forms are, um, are um, mentioned in the previous literature that they indicate the vague standards. So we counted the frequency of use of those vague uh, terms in uh, franchise uh, franchisor obligations for each FDD. And for franchisor, franchisee socialization, we use the number of training hours provided by the franchisor. And for the franchisee, franchisee socialization, we use the dummy variable um, indicating whether there is a franchisee association established within the franchise system or not. We understand that with the secondary data, there is always a limitation because these are proxies, not accurate uh, measures. So we also run robustness check using alternative measures for last two uh, types of socialization. Okay, so these are the descriptive statistics and the correlation matrix. And here's the model specification. So the first three equations listed out here are to correct the endogeneity problems because we know that contract ambiguity, the two types of socialization may be endogenous. So following prior research, what we used as instrumental variable, so we use the instrumental variable approach, what we used as the instrumental variables are the mean value of all the franchisors in the focal franchisors industry, excluding the focal franchise were lagging one year. I know it sounds pretty confusing. So let me give you an example like for McDonald's, right? So in our data set, there are 10 more fast food industry franchisors uh, in the mm -hmm. same industry with McDonald's. And we just calculated the average value of those variables for all the other franchisors in this industry, uh, excluding McDonald's itself. Uh, and one uh, using one year lagged value as the instrumental variable because this instrumental satisfy both the exogeneity and the relevance of criteria because they are related because 
the institutional theory, the isomorphic uh, um, effect, right? So the iron cage, uh, we are all living in iron cage. So it's a natural mimetic behavior. We are mimicking others, but on the other hand, they are not directly related to the performance of the individual outlets itself. And last, the two equations are here, um, are our um, hypothesized outcome variables. Uh, one is a franchisee initiated litigation and last one performance. And we estimate them simultaneously using this conditional mixed process regression system equation approach because it's good at accounting for correlated errors and for this uh, recursive system equations. Okay, uh, so here are our results. Uh, we can see that all the results are supported. The contract ambiguity has a negative effect, do have a, a negative effect on the number of franchisee uh, initiated litigation and the franchise or franchisee socialization further strengthens the effect because it also has a negative sign here and the franchisee franchisee socialization weakens this effect because the joint effect becomes positive and franchisee initiated litigation uh, significantly affects or negatively impacts the financial performance of the franchise system. And we use the, we run a simple slope analysis to graphically illustrate this moderating effect. All right, so after this uh, study is done, we also conduct another uh, study three, which is uh, uh, experiment uh, design to explore the causal mechanisms, the underlying mechanisms that support our argument or hypothesis. Uh, because, um, you know, secondary data can never tell us why, right? So we use the experiment to uh, provide some supplementary insights in terms of why this happens. So what are the mechanisms? Remember, we have proposed the two underlying mechanisms. One is cost prohibitive and the other is uh, uh, the contract ambiguity fosters cooperation. We want to see if this hold true empirically uh, in this experiment setting. So again, we collect the data from real business franchisees. Uh, yeah, it, it takes money uh, to run the experiment uh, and time to run the experiment. And uh, here are the treatment conditions, sorry. And the one italicized representing the high contract ambiguity condition, uh, like reasonable effort, uh, um, uh, also the good faith effort, uh, et cetera. And the one in parentheses like must represent low ambiguity condition is how we manipulate the condition. And our results, then we run the Makova analysis after conducting the manipulation check. And all the results are supported except for one result. Um, so because we propose two mechanisms, the cost effective prohibiting effect was uh, greatly was, was strongly uh, supported, but for the uh, interest based approach, we did not find a significant of it effect of it on the intention to litigate, which means that this uh, variable may not serve as a strong mediator as the cost uh, as the litigation cost. All right. So overall, uh, I guess we can summarize our study now by discussing its theoretical contributions. So the first contribution we identify is to bring this new concept to the uh, business literature, contract ambiguity, which had not been uh, uh, um, studied in the prior business studies in inter-organizational governance uh, literature, uh, although it indeed um, uh, it, it's indeed quite prevalent. Uh, mm -hmm. Professor? What's that? Sorry. Um, there's a question raised by a participant. So, okay. Um, a participant has asked, in finance literature, mm -hmm. there are studies shown, showing the relationship between ambiguity preference mm -hmm. and individual's risk preference. Mm -hmm. So do you think that taking ambiguous contract indicates that the franchisee is to be more risk-taking which leads to a higher prob probability in getting into a lawsuit? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I, I like that uh, you also mentioned in the financial uh, study, in the financial study, in the finance literature, there have also been uh, uh, some research on the effect of uh, ambiguity, contract ambiguity. Well, so that's very important to, um, I, I, my response is that in, uh, it's very important to distinguish 
which part of the contract is ambiguous, right? So I guess, uh, so in our, in our um, case, we study the contract ambiguity of franchisor obligation, how it influences franchisees uh, initiated litigation, right? So when you say the, um, the contract ambiguity may indicate the franchisor is more risk taking, um, and I'm not sure, you know, which section of, of franchise, uh, which section of the ambiguity are we, uh, should we examine here? So uh, it could be that, uh, yeah, I think it makes sense to argue that, uh, to, to uh, speculate that, you know, franchisors, uh, ambiguity, uh, the ambiguity of franchisors own obligations uh, indicate, indicate its uh, own tolerance of its risk. And on the other hand, the ambiguity regarding the franchisee's obligations also indicate its tolerance of the risk, right? So which, which, which- The question uh, is about franchisees. What's that? The, the question is about franchisees. Obligation. Basically. Yeah, franchisor proposed the contract. I see. Which is ambiguous. Uh -huh. And the franchisee would like to take the contract. I see, yes. It indicates that the franchisee- Got gotcha, you, got gotcha. Gotcha, gotcha. Thanks for so much for clarification. Yes, so that that matches, right? Yes, I think to some extent it does indicate that franchisees uh, are willing to take the risk, but I would say that to a greater extent it indicates that franchisees have no choice because the franchisees is the weaker party, right? So they uh, they they don't have uh, much choice. They want to. They may have some other considerations rather than uh, the risk tolerance. But I would say that risk tolerance is indeed one of their. Uh, uh, one of their uh, uh, consideration, because with other factors held constant, we would say that some franchisees are more uh, risk tolerant than others. So then these uh, franchisees are more willing to take the ambiguous contracts. Yes. Thank you so much for your question. Okay, so let me continue here. So the first contribution is to introduce this uh, new concept. And the second one is to show empirically and also theoretically uh, how contract ambiguity could be used by the franchisor to minimize the franchisee initiated litigation. And also we review the underlying mechanisms uh, for this relationship, the two mechanisms as shown in our experiment. And lastly, we also contribute to the growing literature on the joint effects of formal and relational contracting. Um, so we, we are saying that one type of socialization is used very well uh, jointly with uh, contract ambiguity, but the other type of socialization sort of backfires. All right, for the managerial implication, we want to say to franchisors that uh, you should realize that contract ambiguity could be a strategic uh, tool that you can employ potentially to deter the undesirable outcome. And the second, we highlight the important role of franchisor franchisee socialization. Um, uh, you know, it really provides an opportunity for you guys to talk, to communicate, and to solve the minor disagreement, dis disagreement and to avoid to uh, prevent them from escalating to the lawsuits. And lastly, the results suggest that franchisors cautiously consider the development of franchisor uh, sponsored association. You know, this uh, type of socialization may backfire and franchisors should be cautious about it. And of course, uh, like any other research, the limitation, uh, our research also has some uh, limitations. First, we only offer one explanation for firms use of big words, is that the only one explanation is there any other explanation as the question just raised by our law, uh, our finance uh, colleague? Uh, I think there could be some other explanations for it, right? But uh, we didn't examine it in our study. And the second, uh, we did not uh, investigate the joint effects of two different types of socialization, which means uh, the three-way interaction. We skipped that three-way interaction because it's um, it's, it's overly complicated. We want to clarify the first step first. And the third, uh, this work was specifically placed within the context of the franchise system. Uh, can it extend to other contexts? I will say that this uh, finding not only applies to the franchise context, but also to other interorganizational relationships that are characterized by power asymmetry. 
you know, if the, uh, there's some asymmetrical power between the two parties, then one party could strategically leverage the contract ambiguity to achieve the intended purposes. All right, so much for this study. Um, I do hope to uh, um, have another few minutes to introduce the second study of mine, which has been published in Alabama Law Review uh, a, a few uh, a couple of years ago in, in 2018, also with uh, Uri. Uh, so, our, so the title is Are Disclosures Readable? The Case of Franchising. So in this study, we, uh, um, we, we we, we, we find that through a case study of 523 US disclosures that many of the franchise disclosure documents are not that readable. Although one major goal of federal disclosure laws is to make the disclosure documents readable so as to uh, uh, deliver the necessary information to the franchisees. But what we find in our study is they are not that readable. Uh, it, on average, it takes more than 20 years of education for the franchisees to have a good understanding of the FDDs on the first to read. Uh, so we used this Gunning Fog Linguistics Readability Index. We generated that index. That index was widely used uh, uh, in linguist, uh, computational linguistics study to measure text readability and was first uh, created by Professor Robert, uh, Robert uh, Gunning. That's why it's called the Gunning Index, Gunning Fog Index. And this value was created in such a way that the value of this index is equivalent to the number of years of education it takes to read the text, to have a good understanding of the text. So uh, we run the regression analysis uh, and identified some significant predictors for predicting the uh, fog value. And interesting, interestingly, we found that both the franchisor age and franchisor size are negatively related to the fog value, which means that if the franchise work grows more mature or if the franchise system is larger, then they tend to make the franchise disclosure documents more readable. So maybe because they understand the importance of the readability of the FDDs, uh, but for those younger and uh, smaller franchisors, their FDDs are really hard to read. And of course, the other predictor is the length of FDDs. A thicker FDDs would just make the uh, text less readable. Okay, for the discussion, we are saying that uh, the policymakers should really provide a clear mechanism to determine what constitutes a readable disclosure and uh, rule uh, and provides a deterring sanction against the failure to comply. And also a federal trade commission should closely monitor the readability of FDDs and should guide the franchisors on how to write, how to write readable disclosure. These are the implications we draw from this study. And uh, we, we didn't expect that, but uh, you know, the, certainly the practitioners find it also interesting. This study was featured in Wall Street Journal on May 1st, uh, 2018. I guess it provides some implications for the practitioner as well. Okay, so that's uh, the end of my presentation today. Thank you so much for your attention. Uh, and I look forward to open the discussion uh, with you now. Yeah. So um, thank you very much, Dr. Zhang. The floor is open to any questions. Just one question. Uh, can I ask a question, please? My sure, name sure. is Michael Simples from the from the law school. Um, I, I don't know any uh, anything about this particular area of contracts, but I I know about uh, shipping contracts mm -hmm. uh, where the ambiguity is created by the time pressure. So it's mm -hmm. not strategic strategically ah, implied, but but what we 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 see there is that when you have um, uh, a decision by a court that clarifies a particular uh, contractual clause, the parties will react by confirming or clarifying the clause according to the court's uh, decision and whether this is towards their uh, interest or not. So if mm -hmm. your assumption is that there is a strategic um, preference mm -hmm. for ambiguity, then if you examine the changes in the contract 
after the major um, decisions of courts, mm -hmm. um, you should be finding uh, a return to ambiguity rather than an effort um, to, to further clarify the contractual arrangement. And, and I noticed that you have contracts that, that go over 10 years. So have you had an opportunity to look at this type of arrangement and see what is the reaction of the parties to, um, uh, to, to case law, essentially? Yeah, yeah. So you mentioned another important stage in uh, solving the disputes. That is when something uh, conflicts like indeed happen, how do they respond to such conflicts, right? Even though after they bring the uh, suits uh, to court, uh, how would they respond to, uh, to, to solving the uh, disputes? Actually, we indeed conducted some other studies in finding the uh, in, in examining the uh, conflict uh, solving approach. And uh, you are probably also aware that in reality, more than 70% uh, uh, of the disputes are settled out of court rather than using, uh, are settled by the court ruling. Uh, and um, um, so, so I think the contract ambiguity, uh, you just also mentioned that uh, I totally agree with you, sometimes the firms may respond to it out of time pressure, uh, not of uh, strategic uh, reasons. Uh, maybe they were just, uh, um, they, they don't have many other choices, but out of, you know, uh, time pressure. Uh, so, so are you suggesting that we could study, you know, after the conflicts arise, how firms could respond to such conflicts rather than, you know, how, how, how the contract was drafted in the first place? No, my question is really, uh, if, if you have a, a, a decision by a court that mm -hmm. clarifies the uncertainty of what is reasonable, mm. of what is a reasonable time, okay, right. reasonable efforts or fair, uh, whatever. I see. Um, if, if somebody has put this word in the contract for the purpose of having strategically, um, strategic ambiguity, okay, so they are doing it for purpose so that they, um, uh, they get agreements and then um, mm -hmm. They do it, they, they avoid uh, conflicts because uh, the people that are going to sue them are uncertain about what their rights are. Okay, so if the court specifies them, specifi say specifies this, um, this particular uh, term, then mm -hmm. if the reason is really strategic, what I would expect as a reaction by some stronghholder, uh, uh, some b business, then would be to rephrase the particular. Uh, mm -hmm. clause so as to achieve the same uh, effect of ambiguity. I see, I see. Okay, gotcha. so that's, that's what I'm saying. And because you have contracts uh, over right. 10 years, you perhaps be able to actually not mm -hmm. look statistically, but by doing analysis on particular contracts linked with particular companies, be able to see such an effect which will um, support your argument. Yes, absolutely. That's a great suggestion. Um, and I completely agree with you that uh, um, you know, the, how the court, how the term was interpreted in court. So basically the court is rewriting the contract when some ambiguous term arises. And we, we know that in the law literature and we know that uh, in reality as well, the franchisors are typically the more resourceful party and the more experienced party in court. So they always have the, uh, the, the tools and the resources needed to to win over court, basically, you know, compared with the franchisees. So we, we indeed have a study before that examines the outcome, so-called outcome favorability of the litigation brought by franchisor, either franchisor or franchisee. So we found that indeed more cases are favoring the outcome or favoring franchisor, which is consistent with the findings of prior litigation. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, professor, yeah. uh, there's a question from a participant. Mm -hmm. So uh, back to your contract ambiguity project, mm -hmm. if you measure socialization between franchisor and franchisee as the training hours provided by franchisor, mm -hmm. it should increase franchisee system financial performance. Then why didn't you include this relationship in the conceptual framework? Oh, so we use the training hours between the franchise or provided by the franchisor as a measure for 
the uh, socialization that occurs between the franchisor and the franchisee, because this is the major opportunity, major channel for them to actually talk and communicate, right? Uh, because uh, they they don't like, uh, um, they are business partners, right? This is the most often uh, used way channels for them to communicate. Uh, and of course, we also run robustness check uh, by using the measure of the number of contractual clauses with regard to the franchisor's obligations, um, sorry, uh, with the regard to the, ongo the uh, required services that should be provided at the franchisor to franchisee as the alternative measure. For example, the franchisor are expected to uh, like offer uh, support for their site selection or offer support for their advertising campaign. So we believe that through these opportunities, they can also talk and communicate. So we use that as an alternative measure. Anyways, um, so um, yeah, so uh, you are saying that the outcome variable should include franchisee financial performance as well. Is that a question? Okay. No, yes. no, no. Hello, Professor. Uh, yes. no, I, I agree the socialization between franchisor and the franchisee is valid, but my question is back to your conceptual framework. Uh -huh. can, you, can you back to your sure, PPT sure. slide to the conceptual framework? Yeah. My question is why you include why you didn't include the relationship between the socialization socialization of franchisor and the franchisee to the financial performance fi franchisor financial performance. So error. Yeah, yeah. Yes, this, error this from here. Error yeah, from exactly. Yes. Um, it just makes the framework uglier. I oh, think. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Okay, I, I made, made a mistake. So. <laughs> so you are, your, your dependent variable is the franchise, I mean, we not the franchisee. Right, we were interested in the moderating role of uh, franchise or franchisee socialization, right? We are not interested in the director role. The director role has been studied by prior literature, like the non-contractual governance, the, its effect on the financial and the relational oh, outcome. It has been studied in prior literature. Like uh, you know, uh, Kevin's uh, um, uh, jo uh, Professor Joe's study, uh, uh, and also Popo, right? Uh, so yeah. we have a lot of studies on that already. So here we were just interested in the moderating role of socialization. Okay, thank you, thank you. Yeah. So another another question, maybe it's quite a, a naive question, but I just wondering, the model seems like a moderated mediation model, right? We don't have the mediator uh, specifically uh, uh, put in our model, so it's not a technically uh, moderated mediating mediated mediation uh, effect. And also, when we test the mediation effect, we didn't test the moderating effect. Moderate. Oh, yeah, yeah. So they, yeah, they are not tested simultaneously. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No problem. Okay, so there are no more questions stated in the chat box. So I see there are some new messages in the chat box. Uh, those have already been answered. Okay, so uh, I guess this is the conclusion for the. Oh, you have another question from yes. the on ground audience. Okay, uh, first, uh, thank you, Professor Jordan, for giving us a very impressive uh, uh, lecture. So I have two questions. First, uh, is that uh, this contract ambiguity uh, is very interesting. So, how do you find this uh, this uh, this construct? And uh, second question is that we know that this paper is published on journal marketing. I want to know uh, how long is it from its initiation to the final publication? And uh, a third question is that. Um, Yes, uh, in this paper, we talk about the positive effect uh, of con uh, contract ambiguity on franchisee litigation. Uh, litigation. I, I would like to know uh, the, the effect of the contract ambiguity on, on free writings. So it is a uh, reduce or, uh, reduce or uh, enhance the Franchisees for writings. Mm, okay, thank you. Okay, so let me answer your question one one by one. Thank you for your question. So the first uh, question is, how did we identify, find out, think about this co concept, yes. right? Contract ambiguity. So it started from the 
uh, uh, just the anecdotal observation. So because I uh, had like uh, more than 500 copies of franchise agreements in my computer, so I was just uh, checking them one by one. Uh, so I started my interest in the franchise contracts even back in my PhD program. So I was um, kind of quite familiar with those uh, franchise contracts. So I uh, I just uh, observed, I noticed that, that uh, there are some a lot of vague words in the franchise contracts. So that's why I was mentioning this to Uri when I met him in a conference uh, back in uh, Spain. Um, so that conference was uh, in year 2000. Uh, um, 2015, I believe. So you, you, you can estimate how long it takes to uh, actually eventually publish this paper. From the uh, initiation, the idea to uh, eventual publication, it takes about five years. Yeah, and also your last question is, yeah, so last question is also very important. It Again, it goes back to my earlier um, uh, comments on, you know, when we study the contract ambiguity, we should be really clear about which section of contract ambiguity are we uh, studying. So because contract ambiguity of franchise for obligation and uh, on the franchisee obligation would have different effects. So I think the one uh, to your, uh, relate, uh, answering your question, the one that is related to franchisee free writing should be the contract ambiguity with regard to the franchisee's obligations. If you give a lot, them a lot of leeways, a lot of uh, uh, ambiguous uh, uh, terms reg with regard to their obligations, then they could potentially engage in opportunistic behaviors and be a free riding behaviors because it's just a, would be hard for you to verify whether their behaviors are uh, out of uh, their own interest or uh, in response to the local needs. Right, yeah, because sometimes we do allow the franchisees to uh, engage in local innovations or respond to the local needs. But if you your obligations are kind of ambiguous, then it just increases your cost to verify, to, 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 to detect which one is the real, uh, real, real reason uh, that they, their behaviors deviates. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so I see that there are no more questions. So this is the conclusion for the joint seminar event today. Once again, I would like to express our deepest gratitude towards the generous support and presence of our honorable guests and participants. I would like to thank our guest speaker, Dr. Zheng Xu. Thank you all for your participation in this event and we look forward to seeing your attendance at future events.